and stuff you can look at at your convenience. Exactly. exactly. Oh, it was uh, it was very nice, but but as as you said, you know, I mean, the, the the people element is missing. It kind of is a little. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> artificial. It is a little bit of yeah. a. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I you know during the summer I wasn't too bothered. Um, it was a novelty being at home and not feeling tired all the time and all the rest. But uh, as the years gone by, it's become a bit bit difficult not having the normal interaction. Even locally, I mean, even in, in Glasgow, you know, the university's effectively been closed. In the hospital, we all go in and we do our, we have this week on, week off system. So we go and we do that and we go away and we work at home. In the intervening time, so you just don't see people in the same way you did before, and mm. uh, as time goes by, it becomes a problem. So, John, when is the DAPA preserved ejection fraction trial being presented? <clears throat> Sorry, uh, BJ, we were <clears throat> just talking about that yesterday. Truthfully, it probably won't be uh, at the current rate until 2022. So. Emperor Preserved will beat us, but that is actually, we have really caught up on, on them. The difference is our target number of events is much larger than your, theirs. Ours is about 1,100, theirs is 800 and something. So um, assuming we run to planned conclusion, in other words, to the target number of events, it will not be until early 2022. Uh, if we had the same target number of events that they did, then actually we would be not far behind. Um, so, I mean, of course, there will be, the DSMB will be looking at this. There will be an interim analysis, and I suppose it will probably depend on what our data look like and, and whether or not Emperor Preserved is positive and how positive it is. I mean, DAPA CKD was stopped early by the DSMB. It's it's possible the same thing might happen with Deliver. I don't know. Scored seems to give some hope that it may work. I think so. Uh, okay, I know. was not was not. You know me. I'm a I'm a glass half empty person rather than a glass half full normally. But the Sotoclofosin data, the soloist worsening heart failure. Uh, data, the com combined analysis of the preserved ejection fraction patients from Soloist with those from SCORED, so that was a reasonably large number of about 750 patients with FF, patients. very strongly positive results. Now, not definitive, but much better than I had hoped for, and uh, if it's true, and I have no reason to believe it isn't, then that, I think, completely changed our perspective about both Emperor Preserved and, and Deliver, where we were, because of the history of failure in HEF-PEF, we were a little pessimistic, but now we've got hope, uh, hope to believe we might find something. Hello, CSI backend. Are we ready or not yet? Hello? Sir, just another a minute or two at the latest, sir. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. okay. So, Marcin, any word on the street, industry-wise, about what's happening about sotaclofosin? Because, you know, obviously, with the breakdown in the arrangement between Sanofi and Lexicon, this is a bit of an orphan drug, but one that looks remarkably effective. Um, yes. Do you think there'll be anybody interested in it? Or? I mean, not from our side, uh but quite frankly, I think there will be there will be other companies that uh, that 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 will be o on the on the half pep thing. I think we are we are kind of unfortunately playing a little bit of a catch up uh, uh, with uh, with GLP ones, but we, we're also going to start the half pep study with. Yeah, I, I I knew you were um, as some of my friends are in involved. I, I, I think I, that's I think that's a great idea. Semaglutide also. Pardon me? We're starting semaglutide trial. Yes, we, we're, we're actually doing two. We will do one in diabetes and, and one with without diabetes. So in heart failure. In, in HEFPEF, yes, in preserved ejection fraction. So I'm doing that for India. 
cool. That's. Uh... Yeah, I think it was a smart move for lots of reasons, um, and and probably best to avoid half ref. I'm really not sure what the answer might be there. Ah, yes. Did we move the definition of half ref in that Simaglu tried to forty percent? So that takes care of mid range, the so called mid range. I'm not sure, Marcin. What you're, I, I, I'm not personally involved in the semaglutide trial, so I don't know what the lower ejection fraction cut point is. But all the other HEP, HEP, HEP trials today, all of them are using 40% as the cut point. Yeah, so semaglutide is also using 40%. I think we're using 40% as well. 40%, yeah. It's 40%. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Oh. So, uh, BJ, this is getting interesting because, uh, predictably, of course, I've got something else, uh, which is a DSMB <laughs> meeting that I will have to okay. be at. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not for a while, but um, uh, we won't do any questions, John, uh, right now. Uh, as soon as Marcin finishes, you give your talk, and then we okay. can see. Okay. I mean, I think, I think mine's three o'clock, which is about an hour's time, so it's probably oh, all right, but... That's more um, than a we start. Yes, even that we start in the promise, two minutes. Yes. DJ <laughs> <laughs> uh, taught me a long time ago about something called Indian time, which is a slightly more elastic concept than... <laughs> yeah. Really elastic, John. Oh, but that is that is so true. When when I moved from Poland to Switzerland, then the Swiss time also oh. <laughs> that was quite a uh, that was quite a change as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and it's so serious as well. I mean, I remember one time we were late for something, and I sort of kind of tried to joke about it, and and it was it was not a joke. Being late in Switzerland, so uh, no, 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 not at all, not at all. Although time doesn't fly very fast in <laughs> Switzerland, but it's very precise, if I may say. <laughs> yes, well, it's always interesting to talk to people who've moved to Switzerland and their experiences uh, of living there. But as you know, Marcin, obviously, lots of people prefer to live in France or Germany. Oh yes. Um, it's it's an experience in itself, uh, I would say. Uh, so, what's the specific point, John? Uh, well, you don't want to be doing things like cutting your grass, hanging out your washing, uh, doing your washing, uh, and and generally living an active, ordinary life, having a good time, being out late at night, drinking too much alcohol, uh, being rowdy or raucous or um you know it's a it's That's, a bit it's a bit more I don't know how to describe it how would you describe it marcin that's boring also, <laughs> that's all so all, correct all it's the things that marcin did in poland pro probably probably non-dynamic is the best <laughs> way i would describe it <laughs> okay are two minutes up or not yet <laughs> Hello, CSI backend. Hello. It'd be fascinating to know what exactly the technical issue is. I mean, so we're using Zoom, but presumably somehow this is being transmitted through another portal that presumably allows a larger number of delegates to to, so Zoom, to log on to it. Zoom has a limited number of people which can join in, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I think some kind of backend machinery that then transmits it, right? To yeah. The... And, and that, that's presumably where the problem is. But I wonder what the nature of that problem is. If it's oversubscribed, is it crashed? Or... Presumably, the company doing that will have super duper wonderful, fast, and, and multiple and backed up internet connections. So presumably it's not there. Unless it's a software glitch, then uh, it's... Uh, then, we got, then we got a problem. <laughs> yeah. 
it's probably the internet connections are a bit, but. Uh, Let's see. Hello, CSI. You're not even answering. So I can see in one of my windows the the sort of uh, the the broadcast platform, which seems to be there, with your slides and and your picture. So. Yeah. So I don't know what I have a lim limited understanding of this technology. But apparently, from the problem on on Zoom end, I think this is why they wanted to have the recordings, right? But if the problem is on the back end, then I yeah, it doesn't help then. <laughs> exactly. Then there's little they can do about it, right? <laughs> They probably cannot broadcast. I mean, the, the Zoom end is really about problems with our connectivity. Uh, <laughs> if it's pre-recorded, it's, if their platform is not working, as you said, it doesn't really matter. It's still a problem, whether we're live or or recorded. But it looks like our connections are pretty stable because we can see, hear each other. So I don't think it's. Yes. Hello, Doctor Neha. I'm wondering, VJ, whether. Hmm? Yeah. Yes, John. I was just wondering whether I should record mine right now and send it to somebody just in case. Uh, let's see, we can leave it a few more minutes, see how it goes. Yeah. I mean, that's the ironic thing. It's so easy to actually do a recording on Zoom, uh, but you need to know where to send it. So somebody's recording us at the moment. <laughs> Uh, uh, Dr. Zekma, the platform people are still facing some issue. So what we're going to do is we're going to record this entire session and replay it. Okay, so I think uh, let's go. On let's let's go on with the session. So we can. Uh, did you record up to ten slide? Then we can start. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Professor Zekma, you could start from the tenth slide. Okay. So if, if Marson's already recorded his, why are you making him record it again? Exactly. Yeah, we uh, regarding Dr. Zaikma, we have a pre-recording. Yes. So then, then why? So we I don't need yours, sir. So then, yeah, but then why did we move to yours? Uh, so shall we? Shall we do, uh, uh, Dr. McMurray's? Yes, I think yes. so. Okay, I'm sorry, Dr. Zaikma. No wonder. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. You could stop sharing now, uh, Dr. McMurray. Could you start sharing the minute that Dr. Zaikma stops? I did stop sharing. So. I was I, I have sent them I was enjoying watching Dr. Zachman's lecture. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send a pre-recorded one to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, 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 right. 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 Anytime now you can start, sir. You're on recording. Hey John, welcome to the show. And we really look forward to listening to you about your thoughts on so much of literature which has accumulated over the past couple of years, largely thanks to you. John, all yours. Okay, so I've been challenged with the very difficult task of describing the recent data showing how effective SGLT2 inhibitors are in both chronic kidney disease and in patients with heart failure in just 15 minutes. So these are my disclosures. And as I said, I have to talk about these drugs that we know act in the proximal renal tubule uh, to inhibit the reabsorption of glucose. Originally drugs introduced as a treatment for type 2 diabetes, but in fact now drugs that have been repurposed as really important breakthroughs in the treatment of both chronic kidney disease and heart failure. So these are no longer drugs for type 2 diabetes. So let's start by looking at chronic kidney disease. And we had known for a couple of years that these drugs can prevent the development of renal impairment in patients with type 2 diabetes. But the big question was whether we could also use these drugs to treat patients with established chronic kidney disease. 
and in fact to do that even in patients without type 2 diabetes. So remarkably there are already four large SGLT2 inhibitor morbidity mortality trials and you can see here the first of these to report was the Creedon study in patients with type 2 diabetes. So this was just in patients who had type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. This trial was stopped early for benefit. It was published a year ago. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to move on to the more recent of these trials to report. And the reason I want to talk about this second trial because is because critically, it extended the findings of credence to patients with chronic kidney disease who did not have type 2 diabetes, CKD patients without type 2 diabetes. And that was the DAPA CKD trial, another large trial comparing a different SGLT2 inhibitor to placebo. Uh, so this trial was presented and published a couple of months ago. This trial was also stopped early for benefit, again, as an indication of really how remarkably effective these drugs were that the data monitoring committees felt that they should recommend early termination of the trials for benefit. So these, uh, this heat map describes the patients in DAPA CKD where they lay in terms of renal function compared to the other trials. So as you can see here, the mean EGFR in patients with DAPA CKD was 43, these patients had a relatively high urinary albumin creatinine concentrations. And like the Credence trial, this was a study with a lot of hard renal endpoints. These are renal replacement therapy events, in other words, dialysis uh, or transplantation. And as you can see here, compared to the earlier type 2 diabetes trials, uh, looking at a broad spectrum of patients with type 2 diabetes, these two CKD trials had many, many more patients with uh, end-stage kidney disease events. So this is the primary endpoint. And as you can see, it was reduced by 39%, highly statistically significant benefit. And in around just over two years of median follow-up, a number needs to treat of only 19 patients to prevent one of them uh, having an end-stage kidney disease endpoint. And critically importantly, as you can see here, that benefit of dapagliflozin was seen in patients without type 2 diabetes as well as in patients with type 2 diabetes. So now these drugs are a treatment for chronic kidney disease patients, irrespective of whether they've got type 2 diabetes or not. Here is a critically important secondary outcome this is all-cause mortality. And as you can see here, again, a 31% reduction in all-cause mortality. This has never been seen before in patients with chronic kidney disease with any drug. Cardiology, we're spoiled. We're used to seeing this. Never happened before in chronic kidney disease. And also in DAPA CKD, we had a pre-specified cardiovascular composite secondary outcome, the risk of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization gain reduced uh, by 29% uh, statistically significantly with dapagliflozin. So simple message from this uh, most recent large CKD trial is that SGLT2 inhibitors undoubtedly prevent the development of renal failure in patients with chronic kidney disease. And that's true whether or not CKD patients have type 2 diabetes. So let's now move to heart failure. And again, we've got some new and important data. Uh, this is really about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. A year ago, we presented DAPHF. Very recently, the EMPEROR reduced trial was presented, a trial with a different uh, SGLT2 inhibitor and a trial with a slightly different patient population. To get into EMPEROR reduced, you had to have either a lower ejection fraction or a higher natriuretic peptide level. So as you can see here, compared to DAPHF, LVEF was of course a little lower, natriuretic peptides were higher. You could get into Emperor reduced with an EGFR as low as 20 mils per minute. In DAPHF, it was 30 mils per minute. So of course, in Emperor reduced, the mean EGFR was a little bit lower, 
patients actually were even better treated than in DAPHF with almost one in five of them treated with Sucubitril valsarsin. Here are the two trials side by side. These primary end, uh, endpoints, although they look slightly different, are essentially the same. So CV death or worsening heart failure events in DAPHF really meant CV death or heart failure hospitalization. You can see the two trials giving an almost identical result, a 25 to 26 percent relative risk reduction, completely consistent early onset of benefit, both trials statistically significant difference in these cumulative instance curves within 30 days of randomizing patients. And remember, these are trials in HEFREF patients, again, with and without type 2 diabetes. This is not about treating diabetes. This is about treating HEFREF. And here are the two trials side by side in more detail for all the other endpoints. I'm not going to read through this um, line by line. But if you look, you will see that by and large, these benefits are completely consistent in the two trials. And again, the most important consistency here, the most important message, benefit in patients in both trials without type 2 diabetes. This is a heart failure treatment. This is not just a diabetes treatment. Now, of course, it's also important to make people feel better or stop them getting worse. It's not just about hospital admission, not just about mortality. And in both of our trials, we looked at patient well-being. We used the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. We saw a statistically significant increase in the proportion of patients with a clinically meaningful improvement in symptoms. In fact, there was a statistically significant reduction in the proportion of patients with a clinically meaningful deterioration in symptoms. And not only that, but we actually saw a large uh, improvement statistically in patients with a big improvement in symptoms, a 10 or a 15 point improvement in symptoms. And the number needed to treat here, for example, is only 14 over a period of eight months to have one patient report a clinically meaningful improvement in symptoms. Remember, this is the patient's report of their own symptoms. If you prefer the physician's assessment of patient well-being, well, here's data from Emperor Reduce just to show you the same thing in a different way. Uh, more people improving NYHA class with empagliflozin compared to placebo, fewer patients deteriorating in NYHA class with empagliflozin compared to placebo. And that's not the only benefits of these drugs, uh, linking the heart and the kidney, because of course we know they are intimately interrelated. In both trials, there was a reduction in the renal comp standpoint, not quite significant in DAPHF, significant in Emperor Reduced, but the two trials together, clearly significant, a 38% reduction in the risk of deterioration in renal function with these drugs. And we see that maybe more clearly looking at the slope of decline in EGFR. In both trials, that steady, relentless decrease in EGFR over time that we see in our patients with heart failure, that rate of decline was reduced significantly by SGLT2 inhibition in both trials. Uh, and, and again, both in patients with and without type 2 diabetes a very, very important additional benefit in patients with HEFREF. And what's really important here is the consistency of the benefits in these two trials. Two trials, slightly different patient populations, different drugs in, in the same class, absolutely consistent effects. That gives this new therapy a class one level A uh, recommendation in the new guidelines for sure. Now, these two trials, of course, were in uh, ambulatory patients, outpatients with HFREF. There are, of course, remaining questions. What about hospitalized patients? What about patients with HFREF? Well, in fact, very recently, we saw some new data with another related agent called sotocloflozin in a study that enrolled patients admitted to hospital with decompensated heart failure. Now, this trial focused only on patients with type 2 diabetes. And interestingly, this study also enrolled some patients 
with half calf, although most patients had half ref. And patients, as I said, were identified as a result of a heart failure hospitalization, and they were started the treatment either before discharge or within 72 hours of leaving hospital. And this is the effect of sotagliflozin on the combined uh, composite endpoint in this trial. You can see here, again, this really striking benefit of 33% relative risk reduction, very short follow-up period in this trial, only nine months, but very clearly a large benefit. And again, emerging very early, once more in this trial, these curves were st statistically significantly different within 30 days of randomization. So we now know that we can use these drugs in patients who've been hospitalized as well as in patients in the community. When you put these three trials together, I mean, it is remarkable. The consistency of benefits is astonishing and the strength of evidence is uh, very strong indeed. So in 2020, that leaves us in a very interesting place. For many years now, we've had our three core or foundational therapies. We've now tested on top of these, believe it or not, five different distinct pharmacological interventions. In the new guidelines, two of these clearly will take precedence because these are life-saving interventions. Uh, Neprilysin inhibition, which I've not talked about, Secubitril in addition to Valsartan, and of course, SGLT2 inhibition. So we've got five, uh, we now have five foundational therapies, five core therapies that are the bedrock of everything else that we should do in heart failure. And these can be given in four pills uh, because of course, Secubitril Valsartan is uh, a single tablet. So do we really need to use an SGLT2 inhibitor and an epilysin inhibitor on top of our core therapies? That involves effort, expense, and so on. And people question whether we should do. Well, just uh, look here at the top panel in this meta-analysis. So these are the patients in DAPHF and in Emperor Reduced receiving an RNA at baseline. And what you see here is that these patients who were already benefiting from nephrolysis inhibition, when they were given, in addition, an SGLT2 inhibitor, they had a further 32% reduction in the risk of facial, non-facial heart failure events. So unequivocally, these drugs both uh, give benefits and that benefit is additive. So to summarize my quick gallop through all this new evidence, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are now much more than just glucose lowering therapies for type 2 diabetes. They're amazing drugs. It's a bit like the ACE inhibitor story. ACE inhibitors started as antihypertensives, but we now use them in heart failure and chronic kidney disease after myocardial infarction. That is how you have to think about SGLT2 inhibitors. They reduce the risk of developing a heart failure and kidney. Uh, a reduction in kidney function in patients with type 2 diabetes. And I've shown you their striking benefits, both in patients with established chronic kidney disease and patients with established heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. And remember, those benefits are seen irrespective of whether patients have type 2 diabetes or not. They're already the new standard of care in heart failure and also chronic kidney disease. And really, our challenge going forward into the new decade starting 2021 is how do we implement this incredible new evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that wonderful presentation as always. Um, since you have to leave, maybe, uh, maybe we can have a few quick questions for you. Um, one would be that as the data from SCORD has shown that there was in addition a reduction of strokes and myocardial infarction. Uh, and there was some suggestion that are these the effects of um, SGLT1 inhibition rather than SGLT2 inhibition? Because as far as I remember, this kind of an effect was not seen in the Emperor or DAPA trial. That's one. 
and second is that uh, one of the advantages of liraglutide which was mentioned when uh, the previous speaker was speaking was that it reduces the uh, atherosclerotic disease so if we take it that we get actually uh, one and two inhibitors would do not only reduction in heart failure but do the same thing that the one agonist would do Uh, VJ, before I answer, I hope they can cut and edit this, but uh, the second question you asked to me was obscured by some buzzing noise. Um, so I, I heard the question about cytokal closing. I'll answer that, and, and then maybe you can ask, ask me the second question again. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, yes, VJ, I, I didn't talk about the SCORE trial, which was the cytokal closing chronic kidney disease trial because for various reasons that trial had to stop early, had a very short follow-up, and therefore couldn't look at chronic kidney disease events, although it did report cardiovascular outcomes. And as you've said, astonishing, astonishingly, in that trial, there was a reduction in the total number of myocardial infarctions and the total number of strokes. Now, with myocardial infarction, We've seen some evidence in meta-analyses of SGLT2 inhibitor trials previously that there may be a reduction in myocardial infarction. I don't think it's as striking as with GLP-1 receptor agonists, but we've never seen a reduction in stroke before with SGLT2 inhibitors. And we've clearly seen that with GLP-1 receptor agonists. So this was a very new finding. And I suppose you're right to speculate, could this be due to the SGL? SGLT1 action, uh, inhibiting action, sorry, of sotoclofosin. It certainly seems to have that. So although it's 20 times more potent an inhibitor of SGLT2, there was, as you know, an increase in diarrhea uh, as a side effect with sotoclofosin, which we never seen with the other SGLT2 inhibitors. So that probably is an indication that really is having this additional effect. I do not know specifically why inhibiting SGLT1 would protect against stroke, but, but that's certainly an interesting hypothesis. Harsh, you have to unmute yourself. Do I have any data on patients having EGFR less than 30? So which will be the best drug in those group of patients, treating patients with EGFR less, less than 30? So uh, in DAPA-HF, we did not go below 30, but our friends in the Emperor Reduced trial did. They went as low as 20. And in the DAPA-CKD trial, we went down to an EGFR of 25. So we do have uh, evidence that, I would say evidence that you can use these drugs safely down to an EGFR of 20. And, and I've personally been doing that but you do have to be careful. There is an initial small decline in EGFR with some people. Very importantly, and of, of great interest in terms of mechanisms, that initial decrease is slightly or partially reversed within a few weeks. So again, you have to be careful when you do the measurement in terms of how you interpret it. But, but if you have, I would say if you have a patient with an EGFR uh, below 30, you probably do want to monitor their EGFR, maybe check it two weeks and four weeks after you start uh, patients on treatment. If you use uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in people with an EGFR below 20, uh, then I think you have to, again, to be careful and to watch the renal function. Interestingly, the product labeling, at least in Europe, uh, has not specified a lower limit of EGFR for these drugs in patients with heart failure, even though the trials did have a lower limit. The product labeling acknowledges that we don't have much experience of using these drugs in people with a very low EGFR, but it does not prohibit their use in those individuals. And again, we have been over the past year or so cautiously using these drugs in patients with a very low EGFR. And, and I have to say so far without any major problem I'd like to comment of Dr. Marson. What is the role of GLP-1 in patients of EGFR less than 30? Are there any benefit in those patients? 
Is Dr. Marston with us? Yes, uh, I'll just get to unmute myself. Thank you very much for the question. So uh, I think we have uh, we have studies to support that uh, that the GHRs can be used in people with EGFR below 30, and uh, there are also ongoing uh, experiments uh, within the flow study that will actually demonstrate uh, that further with uh, semaglutide. So uh, I think this is uh, this. So we are we are glad to tell you that we are on live. Oh. So <laughs> they have been watching your lecture. Okay, please. Okay. So, so, shall we? No, no, no. Uh, I think we'll just carry on. After this, Dr. Neha will speak. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Neha Sekre is ready. Can we go with Dr. Neha Sekre's presentation, sir, next? Please don't interrupt. Thank you. <laughs> Marcin, can you do a completing? <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's okay. It's really an adventurous uh, event. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I must say yes. So, so the short answer is yes. We have data to uh, to uh, to suggest that uh, that up to the level of EGFR. Of Dr. Sekre, you could start sharing your laptop, please. Well, can you? We will manage it. Please don't interrupt. Now we are doing. Ma'am, can you hear us? I, I, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I think I've been, uh, there, there's an ongoing debate going, uh, Dr. Chopra has just said, so I'll, shall I wait till they finish? There's a terrible buzzing sound as well. Is it just at my end or is everybody hearing I think, that? I, I think it might be, let me, I'm going to join in again. I think that might be my end because I can see something fuzzy on the screen as well. So I'm going to join, I'm going to let you carry on and I'm going to leave and join you again. I hear the noise. So, Marson, third time lucky. Yes, Marson. <laughs> yes, so we have the, in, the short answer is yes, we have data uh, uh, in patients with EGFR up to 15 uh, mils per minute. So that's, uh, that's uh, where, where, where we are covered by the, by the data. That's the short answer for the GFR. Okay. Uh, well, Marcin, you have a, an ongoing trial, don't you? I think the yes, flow yes. study. Yeah. Exactly, and then I, I was mentioning this <laughs> in my previous attempt to, to to answer the question. Yes, and then we have the flow study, which specifically aims uh, for for people uh, at people with a very broad spectrum of uh, of stages of of CKD, and this this study is ongoing, so we get a more definite answer. But still, the flow study is only going to uh, tell us about people with type two diabetes and uh, chronic kidney disease at various stages. So, so it's not uh, purely a a, a a CKD study as such, or or, or chronic uh, renal failure study for that matter. And VJ, I suppose the other interesting thing we've seen recently, again, I, I wasn't asked to talk about it, but of course, where the finerenone data in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease showing a reduction in end-stage renal events and also in cardiovascular events. Not as impressive as with SGLT2 inhibitors, but I think we would believe that those treatments were likely to be added if, you know, to have a complementary mechanism of action that doesn't overlap and therefore to give added benefits so in the in the kidney world it's, it's amazing two breakthroughs in, in 12 months john the uh, finry known is starting fine arts trial we are doing that in india also so that's yeah. also looking at these endpoints. yeah we're very excited about that because again you know we we think that mras probably work in hef -PEF. we need to prove it and we got the opportunity with this new type of MRA, but of course nobody ever knew if, if non-steroidal MRAs like Phenernone really do work. So at least the, the uh, Fidelio DKD study showed that Phenernone is an effective drug. So taking that forward into HEP-PEP is a great opportunity and that trial is recruiting incredibly quickly at the moment. Okay, Marcin and John, thank you very much for all the words of wisdom.
and so sorry for all the interruptions but we will uh, watch your lectures again marsan once it is recorded thank you very much it was a pleasure to join thank you very much for the thank invitation you. thanks vijay bye marsan bye 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 john bye bye everyone bye, bye. dr neha can i invite now dr neha sekri to give talk on case in the box ischemic heart failure assessment of viability dr neha please could we go to the slide show please no ma'am play from start you just got it at the top the first one play from start yeah yeah and uh, just a second your slide is no ah yes perfect yes ma'am we are ready to go you are still muted ma'am could you unmute yourself you are still muted yes ma'am yes, ma hello yes is that is that loud and clear thank you sorry about all the glitches um so thank you very much and uh, good evening to you all and i'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me i'm going to be talking to you on uh, viability so change of tack from the very um informative uh, data based talks uh, by prof mere and dr masini before uh and i'll be talking and taking you through uh, the concept of viability it's not just a definition but a continuum um so in this talk i'll be briefly mentioning the different techniques we use to assess viability and using clinical vignettes i hope to impress upon you that why defining viability is still of clinical importance so the concepts of stunned and hibernating myocardium were described and received much attention in the 1980s uh we now realize that um events related to myocardial ischemia occur perhaps more frequently than what we had previously realized It's always good to go back to nature to better understand this. So in nature we describe hibernation or deep sleep um is the way animals adapt to the climate change and this is to live through extreme cold uh to conserve their energy they lower their body temperature they slow their heart rate and the metabolism is reduced but the body is still alive. But if prolonged they may die. It's important to bear in mind that the concept of myocardial stunning or hibernation can have various causes but for the purposes of this talk I'm going to be focusing on coronary disease. We know that myocardial ischemia is present when the myocardial oxygen demand is not met by coronary blood flow and this imbalance leads to a series of biochemical and physiological events that we now call as the ischemic cascade we also know that perfusion abnormalities occur much earlier on compared to other features such as ventricular dysfunction and symptoms of angina come quite later on in the spectrum of ischemic cascade in 1982 Bronwald and Cloner first described the concepts of myocardial stunning by 
hit uh, as an episode of severe ischemia, run, relief of ischemia before significant irreversible injury results, and stun as a relatively long period of post ischemic contractile dysfunction. Few years later, Rahim Tola and colleagues came up with a smart heart hypothesis and demonstrated very elegantly that revascularization can improve ventricular function. But they also alluded to the fact of timing the uh, interventional strategy. Too late, the effect may be very little or none at all. So this time dependence is critical. As you can see in this very nice cartoon, that if the duration of ischemic injury is prolonged, that leads to both a reduction and in the function of cardiomyocytes, which we think and we understand is what leads to them becoming non-viable. So the problem with viability is that there is no single definition. What we understand is that will revascularization lead to improved myocardial function and contractility? Advancement in diagnostic cardiac imaging has helped us understand various uh, concepts of viability, which could include understanding the myocardial kinetics, perfusion imaging, and also to understand cell integrity. Let's look at this in, uh, in one by one. So if you're using an echocardiogram, if the wall is thinned, it looks bright, makes you suspect that this may be non-viable. And then you do dobutamine stress echo. And if there is no uh, response to low or high dose, you tend to say this is non-viable like cardium. Uh, if you use nuclear imaging, you look for tracer uptake, you look for ventricular perfusion mismatch, and if that is present, then you think this is viable myocardium. If you look at PET, we look for mismatch between myocardial blood flow and FDG uptake. As you can see, uh, on the left, there is no myocardial blood flow, but in the co-localized segments, there is increased FDG uptake. So this mismatch indicates hibernating myocardium. Contrast this on the left. In the most bottom panel, you see no myocardial blood flow and no FDG uptake. This part is non-viable. CT has also been uh, used to assess viability. And in this validation study from 2012, the author suggested that if you have a Hounsfield unit of an unenhanced CT of less than 28, that may give you a good reproducibility with FDG PET on non-viability. However, this is not standard use in clinical practice. If you ask a surgeon, so not unsurprisingly, their response of viability would be on perioperative survival. And the guidelines opine that unless a patient is uh, not a candidate for revascularization of any kind, non-invasive imaging to detect myocardial ischemia and viability is reasonable in patients with known coronary disease. So can we better identify a functionally hibernating myocardium from a structurally hibernating myocardium? CMR, with its parametric imaging, does hold some promise. Uh, using dobutamine CMR, you can look for recruitability and ischemia. And with late gadolinium enhancement, you can look for cell integrity. Uh, these are the suggested comprehensive imaging protocols for dobutamine and adenosine stress CMR, which help you understand function, perfusion, and viability all within one study. So based on that, CMR is often perceived as a gold standard in daily clinical use. Um, it's a technique that helps to identify non-viable myocardial segments. And from what we understand, depending on the extent of the transmurality or extent of late gadolin enhancement, uh, if it's more than 50%, it's likely to be non-viable. If it's less, then it's likely to be viable. 
And this data comes from this seminal work by uh, Kim et al. from 2000, where they nicely that patients who had extent of leg acne enhancement of more than 50%, um, there was very little recovery post revascularization and almost nil if patients uh, had GAD of nearly 100%. But it's important to note that no uh, imaging technique is perfect. In this very paper, again, it was shown that about 20% of the segments which had no gadolinium enhancement did not recover function even post revascularization, taking you to my first slide of the hibernation um, theory that we see in bears. So presence of viability does not mean functional recovery. So I hope I've convinced you that viability is not a single point, but is a continuum. And there is intertwined role of ischemic injury that has a long impact on a patient's um, viable myocardium. So let's look at this 47 year old who had a previous anterior STEMI with PCI to LAD and had CTO to his RCA. His LV function was severely impaired. He went on to have a dobutamine stress echo. And briefly, you can see a four chamber view. This is at rest and you see a thinned akinetic anterior segment with low dose uh, dobutamine. You see um, there is no change neither on the high dose. But if you look at the basal infraroceptum, there is some improvement with low dose, but not uh, sustained on high dose, raising suspicion uh, about the inferior segments. You can better appreciate this in the short axis view, where again, you see thinned anterior akinetic segments at rest and on dobutamine low and high dose, but the contrast this with the inferior segments at rest. This improves on low dose dobutamine stress. And again, the function goes down on high days, high dose dobutamine stress, suggesting a biphasic response, which we understand as ischemia. So this patient went on to have revascularization to the CTO to RCA, as shown in these stills with resolution of his symptoms, no doubt, but also subsequently improvement in function of the inferior segments. Contrast this with the second case. He's a 52-year-old male who presents with NYHA class three symptoms. He's an ex-smoker and a an, um, heavy drinker. So not su unsurprisingly, a diagnosis of alcohol-related LV dysfunction was made as we would do normally, you'd optimize his medical therapy and consider a device if clinically appropriate on follow-up. As with recommended guidelines, a cardiac MRI scan was uh, arranged to help further characterization and to further understand the etiology of heart failure. So the cine images confirm what the echo showed us, that there is severely impaired ventricular function, almost global, which we might say, of course, this could be alcoholic cardiomyopathy. But on late gadolinium enhancement, but on late gadolinium enhancement, you see there is no scar. Everything looks black. So telling you that Maybe there is some reversibility because there is an absence of scar. We did perfusion scanning and you can see there is a significant perfusion defect in the inferior segments. And when we went on to do a coronary angiogram that shows significant burden of coronary disease. So based on the presence of reversible perfusion defects, severe LV dysfunction, absence of any scar. We wondered whether this might improve. Uh, he went on to have a bypass, had a stormy post-op uh, course, needed balloon pump support, but was discharged nine days later. 
Now the true test comes on follow-up. So six-month follow-up here shows that the ventricular function has improved. I don't need to um, state more on that as is evident by the pictures. And this makes us suggest that this is actually a case of hibernating myocardium. And the actual importance of this is that the CMR was crucial to our initial understanding of this case. A follow-up could have been done by ECHO alone. So, should we revascularize all viable myocardium? This is a 46-year-old who has a remote history of chest pain, no formal diagnosis, a bit of moderate alcohol, and he presents with NYH2 to 3 symptoms. Um, the CMR or the echo, um, and then the CMR shows that there is um, severely impaired ventricular function. And even to the eyes of the untrained who are not used to looking at these images, you can see that there is regionality. We went on to do tissue um, characterization after gadolinium enhancement. And as shown by the red arrows, you can see areas of uh, subendocardial scar quite extensive, suggesting that this patient has had a previous infarct. Um, much more better appreciated in the short axis view, uh, where we went on to use the AHA 17 segment classification. And just by looking at the extent of scar, we said, suggested that at least nine out of these 17 segments were non-viable. So what next? If we look at this meta-analysis, um, they show that uh, myocardial viable testing impact uh, may or may not uh, show an improvement in patients uh, with, uh, with, with viability. The results of this meta-analysis actually showed that in patients who had a viable myocardium, about there was an 80% reduction in mortality. But if you look at the same data stratified by treatment, then what you see is that if you had non-viable myocardium, then there was no difference between those who received optimum medical therapy or who were revascularized. Now, critics would argue that these studies were done very uh, in, in the 90s and may not reflect contemporary practice, what we understand from the previous talks today. But uh, more recent trials have also not shown much promise. Uh, there could be limitations for various confounders and the debate continues. And one of the reasons is that there is physiological complexity which may potentially uh, impair our understanding and coming to more conclusive decisions on this very topic of viability and revascularization. So the issues around viability are persistent, remain, um, and you've all um, probably been very, very uh, aware of this recent presentations. Um, and uh, the debate about viability continues. We await the results of yet another trial, um, the REVIVE trial, to see if we can better understand what we've learned so far. Um, but I think it's watching um, the space. So if I start to conclude, I've shown that myocardial stunning and hibernation are points on the same spectrum. Stunned myocardium remains an issue following contemporary therapy for acute myocardial infarction and can contribute to post-MI-LV dysfunction and heart failure. Viability is still a retrospective assessment of left ventricular function post revascularization. And imaging modalities assess different aspects of cell function and integrity. Further trials may help guide management decisions and we wait for more data from these studies. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge my team at BARTS for their contribution to what I've shown today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Neha. That was a wonderful talk.
while the imaging modalities that can test the viability we are having more and more imaging modalities but the question remains when to use this modalities particularly after the all these trials because these modalities these tests are expensive particularly for a country like india so what do you suggest are the key key indications for using these modalities as we stand today so i think i think you ask uh, you asked um uh, asked me questions about the whole of way we practice cardiology in a, in a, in a, in a in a in a in a country where um there are um other economic uh, competing challenges and i think um i think the one the things that doctors don't do very well and and especially i talk as a trainer is that we need to understand the history and we're not even doing our basic uh management of optimal medical therapy um and um the three cases that i've shown you were particularly chosen to show the spectrum of of the pathologies um that can or or, or ischemic just coronary disease um, that patients can present with if there is a target and you can demonstrate reversibility then i think you should go ahead and revascularize the third patient who had such extensive uh scarring there was no point of uh, offering him revascularization because you know we know from tissue characterization that we've seen that there is not going to be any function his role would be um, i mean his ceiling therapy should be medical therapy plus minus a device if if also that could be the contemporary practice um i would um and i think uh, you asked the question of which imaging modalities and and i don't think one can um say oh you should be having um all three or all four types of imaging modalities at each center i mean if you can that's a luxury and that, and that is why patients will benefit most but whatever technique you have you must have competence and the persons who are doing it should have experience in it and that has been the drawback of the stitch trial because you had um you had basically nuclear and you had dobutamin stress echo in those trials but the center competence and the bias that came up could not show you uh you know there's no benefit over or, or on revascularization if you look at the sub study of the stitch uh, of the stitch trial then people hypothesized as i showed in my those few little papers that if you had nuclear you would um, if you had a ct pet you might have done better or if you had cmr you would have done better but i i i i i think you can't really agree or, or say for with certainty that that would make much of a difference except to say develop one skill one imaging modality at the very least in one center and develop expertise and if you can then i think you offer that to your patients and you select your patient groups the ones you think you should be revascularizing thank you very much dr neha that was a wonderful talk i am sure with the new modalities coming up we have some more studies to show us whether these are better than the previous imaging modalities that we have used in this program i think with that we come to the end of this wonderful session where we had three speakers speaking and giving wonderful talks thank you very much to all the speakers we are very well appreciated thank you thank you dr sekhi thank you dr joker bye bye Hello
Yeah, we'll move on the next session, uh, session 12, uh, ESCS CSC combined session. The chairperson will be Dr. Marco Rafi and Dr. Abby Mehta, sir. Hello, everybody. Can Hello, you sir. hear me? Yes, you are audible, sir. Perfect. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take the opportunity to uh, greet all Indian friends uh, in the name of uh, ESC. My name is Marco Roffi, and I'm uh, the ESC ambassador for uh, India and, and Middle East. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. So we will have a, a, a wonderful uh, session here, and I would like to thank uh, the organizer, and especially Dr. Monahan, uh, for this uh, uh, kind invitation. It is always a pleasure for the ESC to uh, have joint events uh, with the Indian friends, although we are missing, obviously, the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meeting, and we hope it will be for next year. So it is also my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. A.B. Mehta, who obviously uh, does not need any introduction, because is one of the most famous interventional cardiologists in India and uh, worldwide. So uh, it's also a pleasure to meet uh, Dr. Mehta. I wanted to, to uh, say hi to him. So we will have a, a wonderful session here. The title is High Risk Core Intervention in 2020. We will have two EST speakers. We will have two uh, CSI speakers. Uh, we have uh, chosen for you a uh, topic we, we hope will be of interest. And uh, we will start uh, first uh, with uh, uh, Lorenz Reber from Switzerland. He is an internationally renowned expert in intravascular imaging. Among other, he's the first author of a very recent uh, consensus uh, paper on uh, intravascular imaging published in uh, a European Art Journal. So it is a pleasure for me to welcome uh, Lawrence, who is a, a very good friend of mine, and uh, he will start the first uh, um, uh, presentation. We will have 14 minutes presentation, four minutes uh, discussion. Uh, obviously, myself and Dr. Meta will uh, uh, lead the discussion, and I, I will invite Dr. Meta then to uh, introduce uh, the next speaker. So, uh, Lawrence, the floor, or at least the virtual floor, is yours. Thank you very much, Marco. Welcome to everybody. I, I hope you can see the slides and hear me clearly. Uh, I can in any way, yes. Very good. So this is about uh, the best indications for intracoronary imaging in daily clinical practice. Basically, you see here the most common indication as not only myself see them, but also as supported by the most recent ESC guidelines for myocardial revascularization. In brief, intracoronary imaging should be used in any case of stent failure, be it thrombosis or restenosis, both class 2A level of evidence B indication. In a uh, to determine lesion significance in intermediate left main stenosis, 2A class and level B recommendation. And in the guidelines say selected patients, what they actually mean is uh, complex PCI and we come to uh, the details what this means. And I added one thing that is not in the guidelines, but I personally consider very helpful is the ambiguous ACS patient where I believe optical coherence tomography specifically can be most helpful. So these are two patients presenting with a closed stent that was previously placed in the RCA. And needless to say that by angiography, you have no clue what the underlying failure reason is. However, if we do perform intracoronary imaging, you can easily, and studies have shown that in more than 90% of the cases you do imaging, you can actually 
get to the very reason why the stent failed. So let's have a look at these two cases. In the first case, OCT shows not only the thrombus confirmative of stent thrombosis, but also malaposition and coronary evaginations that are suggestive of a vascular inflammatory process of positive remodeling. The vessel grew outward and left the stent alone, leading to late acquired malaposition, which was the the reason for uh, stent thrombosis in that case. Here, clearly, an additional stent would be harmful. You just need to post dilate and potentially control the patient again prior that uh, cessation after one year to make sure that finally the stent is well embedded by neointimal tissue. In the second case, there is a bit of neointimal hyperplasia, but mainly within the neointima, there was a de novo. Uh, atherosclerosis, which we call neoatherosclerosis with a plaque rupture, clearly indicating that you should treat this patient not with balloon only as the first is the first case, but with an additional stent. And the pathogenesis of this stent thrombosis is clearly different as compared to the first patient. In terms of restenosis, most frequently, of course, we have a diffuse neointimal hypoplasia. Risk factors can be long stents, for example, but in a notable proportion of up to 40%, stent under expansion is an important finding in the setting of restenosis next to stent fractures, not so frequent, and neoterosclerosis that can occur beyond the first year after stent implantation. But I like to draw the attention to stent under expansion. And actually the differentiation between these etiology cannot be made most times by angiography, but can be clearly provided by intercoronary imaging. This is just an example of a clinically relevant FFR positive restenosis, as you can see here by angiography, and only by the inter by a dedicated intracoronary imaging analysis, you will be able to appreciate that actually in this case, the key problem is stand under expansion. If you draw here or follow the purple line and compare this area with the reference area, you will get the stent expansion of only 60%. And there is only a, a little bit of neointima contributing to this restenosis. So the conclusion here is clearly stent under expansion is the key driver of the restenotic event rather than neointima hypoplasia. And therapy, of course, differs and the material you need. I'm talking about unclear patients where you really don't know whether this little haziness might correlate with a plaque event or not, as shown here in this LAD, where ECG was suggestive of an LAD problem. However, angiography not conclusive at all, but OCT clearly suggested a minute partial plaque rupture within a thin cap fibroatheroma, or at the left, nothing at all could be seen in the circ. However, ball motion abnormalities may suggest that there could be a CERC problem and the screening of the CERC clearly indicated a small rupture with consecutive embolization to the distality of the vessel. So in conclusion, uh, OCT can be helpful to prove that uh, uh, an infarction really took place in a suspected um, infarct vessel. Now, you could argue that in case of haziness, I anyway suggest, it anyway suggests the presence of a pack event that explains my ACS, but not so fast. This is not true because you can have a suspected ACS patient with a haziness that proves not to be related the haziness to a plaque event as shown here. A frequent differential um, diagnosis of a haziness by angiography is just a fibrous plaque without thrombus and nothing, not explanatory of an ACS event or a calcification that has nothing to do with an ACS event. So clearly, if we have an ACS, we need imaging to prove or disprove the presence of a plaque event. This is another good indication, a patient presenting for a diagnostic angiography prior valve in valve procedure, severe aortic stenosis. And you can see here 
an extrinsic left main stenosis. The question is to treat or not. Clearly, I don't prefer to do an FFR in such a patient with severe aortic stenosis. The guidelines suggest to do intracoronary imaging, specifically IBUS, to determine the minimal lumen area, as we did here, and the minimal lumen area of 10 is clearly beyond six square millimeters which can be safely deferred. If you find an IBUS minimal lumen area and the left main of less than 4.5, it requires per default treatment. And if the values are in between, you may decide upon the clinical workup that uh, is already available or an additional FFR. Once you um, treat the left main, imaging is actually something which should not be uh, missed. I just recall that in the NOVEL and in the EXCEL trial, more than two-thirds of patients uh, had actually imaging-guided PCI. So in this case, uh, intermediate left main stenosis with a minimal lumen area of less than four was treated with a stent, and geographically an acceptable result. But by intracoronary imaging, the stent expansion was only 60%, clearly necessitating um, and this despite post-dilatation with a 4-0 non-compliant balloon at 20 atmospheres, clearly indicating that here we should correct the result and improve it and finally prove that we uh, uh, reach levels that are acceptable for a left main by intracoronary imaging. And we should not only use in the setting of left main intracoronary imaging after the stand placement, but clearly start before First, to determine the significance, uh, assess stent dimension, to uh, assess which uh, instrument should be used for lesion preparation, to define the pot balloon diameter, and potentially to decide whether a one versus two stent strategy should be used. Then PCI is followed by pot and side branch wiring, and that would be actually the moment where the second imaging run should be performed to assess stent expansion, malopposition dissection, presence of geographical disc and importantly the side wire position because it should be placed in the distal cell. This will be followed by fenestration report, second stent if needed, hissing balloon report and cut, and then finally the final, hopefully the final imaging run where you assess again stent expansion, malaposition, dissection and potential geographical miss. In summary, I was guided or imaging guided PCI has been consistently shown to improve clinical outcomes, as you can see here in a meta-analysis, including almost 5,000 patients. It consistently has shown to reduce MACE by 40%, cardiovascular death by 50%, and TLR by 40%. One should ask, which kind of patients were included in these RCTs, and these are mainly patients with long lesions, on average more than 30 millimeter, and CTO. So for this patient, uh, this meta-analysis is indicated. We have, as uh, uh, Professor uh, Rofi has uh, mentioned, published a consensus paper where we in detail uh, made recommendations as to what you should achieve after PCI um, if you use imaging. So basically a, a common uh, imaging criteria that you should achieve after PCI. One final word I would mention as this session is on complexity, clearly calcium is defining uh, next water criteria, the complexity of a lesion and calcium can be nicely as compared to a geography depicted by both OCT and IBUS, whereas OCT has the uh, advantage that we can assess the calcium thickness. The calcium thickness is an important predictor whether or not we will be able to crack the lesion. There is actually a good a calcium score that we can assess by OCT that is uh, based on the angle thickness and length. And if we uh, get uh, four points, which means basically a calcium mark more than 180 degree, thickness more than half a millimeter, and length more than five millimeter, it is very likely that by usual a preparatory measures like just balloon inflation, you will not be able to crack the calcium. This is just an example of a calcium lesion that has three points because the calcium is not thick. 
one balloon dilatation already sufficient to crack the calcium and sufficiently expand the stent. However, in the lesion below, the score is four because the calcium is circumferential, long and very thick, and the stent was implanted after P dilatation. And you see that this resulted in gross um, under expansion as we could have predicted by applying the scores. And these are situations where you clearly need additional lesion preparatory methods like rotational arterectomy. You see here the effect. It, 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 it really removes the calcium, makes the calcific pool thinner and therefore amenable for cracking. Or here, an example of orbital arterectomy. So in summary, I would like to state that the ideal um, indication in daily routine PCI is for assessing stent failures. They are infrequent, but nevertheless uh, a concern about 2 to 3 percent of our procedures in any ambiguous AC, ACS patients. Why? Because it really uh, streamlines the downstream diagnostic procedures. You can avoid MRIs, etc. if you can really make a good statement whether or not this is a coronary event for intermediate left main stenosis, and of course, and that's the vast majority, PCI guides, complex lesions, complex, I mean, long lesions, calcified lesions, left main lesions, CTOs, and two stents by patients. These are really key indication for the use of intercoronary imaging that are mostly also supported by the guidelines. And you can expect a consistent clinical benefit from uh, the use of intercoronary imaging when applied for PCI guidance. And as I mentioned, in the context of ACS, uh, you can improve your precision in and uh, efficacy of the diagnostic workup. And with that, I thank you for, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Reber. I'm Dr. Jay Gopal from the Ahmedabad studio. Uh, Dr. Mehdad could not join this. And uh, I think we'll go to the next session and we'll take the discussion at the end of the, end of the talks. Now I invite Dr. Matthew Samuel Kalrekel to his presentation on tackling left main bifurcation. Matthew Sam, please. Yes, sir. Uh, any problem in opening a screen, sharing a screen? Are, are you able to see the slides? Not yet, not yet, sir. Anand, uh, can you just help us? Now it's clear, yes. Thank you. Good, good evening, Dr. Um, thank you for having me on this evening and talk on a very important topic, which is uh, on implication of uh, treating left main disease when it involves the bifurcation. Why is it important? Because once we start looking at the left main, there are various factors involved, the complexity of the lesion, especially the bifurcation when it is involved, the comorbidities, complete revascularization, LV function, and patient's choice. This also comes into play when we make this decision. The unique features of the left main bifurcation is the, the in some most of the, most often it will be involving the osteal as well as the uh, the bifurcation together large size of the side branch and calcification is very frequently present and blunt bifurcation use of stent with of variable variable size suitability the 
left main intervention, if you look at the data, what is available, the syntax five-year data shows. Subset analysis of syntax trial suggested that DES may be acceptable or acceptable option in for patients with left main coronary artery disease and low and moderate coronary artery complexity. This gave us a hint towards attempting left main disease in our daily practice. When you let us look at uh, four data together, the Excel, Noble, Precompact, and Budorit. What, what did we learn from the Excel data? Excel conclusion shows that treatment of patients with left brain coronary artery disease and visually assess low or intermediate syntax score with uh, the cobalt chromium stain resulted in similar rate of clinically meaningful composite outcome of death stroke and MI at five years. This was a very, very encouraging result. But let us look at the next study, which was very much against what we heard in uh, earlier two studies. The noble data shows PCI remained inferior to CABG at five years when you look at the maze. CG, uh, bypass surgery was superior to PCI, also in group with syntax score of less than 23. All cause mortality was similar for PCI and CAB. That is all right, but when it comes to the maze, it is completely different. PCI resulted in high rate of non-procedural myocardial infarction and repeat revascular. Mark that word, the repeat revascularization is what is bothering us today. When you summarize the data from the Excel and Nobel, Excel showed significantly fewer MIs and strong towards strong trend towards the lower mortality with CABG between 30 days and three years. Excel maze and mortality curve for PCA versus CABG cross at three years and will likely to continue to diverge thereafter. In Noble, these curves have already diverged in the beginning itself. CABG and this divergence is to accelerate further. That means the noble data shows strongly in favor of CABG. But when you look at the syntax data at 10 years, still the comparable survival rate is seen in CABG versus PCI in left main coronary artery disease. We keep on getting very conflicting reports, conflicting studies. We still we are not very sure whether we are doing the right thing. Let us look at some of the cases which we have to treat and manage. That was a clear-cut bifurcation. Left main is not involved. Only the, the bifurcation is involved. The main tongue and the shaft of the left main is not diseased. Where a kissing balloon was attempted, they got a reasonable result. This is the follow-up angiogram of the same patient at the end of one year wide open stents and no recurrence of these nose. Similarly, this is a trifurcation involving total occlusion of uh, circumflex, total occlusion of the LAD, disease diagonal, which all were treated with multiple stents and the trifurcation standing and the, the bifurcation and the trifurcation was reconstructed and this was the final result which we were able to achieve. When we follow them up at the end of nine months to one year, again, very, very gratifying result. This is a subset of patients who are not suitable for bypass surgery because various comorbidities did not allow him to go for surgery with the dense calcification of the distal left main involving, again, the trifurcation of the vessels, which needed a debulking device to get the calcium out of the way, which was treated with the uh, rotoblator to the circumflex first and followed by LED. And we were able to get a very gratifying result in this patient also. Another subset of patients, this, uh, uh, this is one of the cases which we did uh, during the live course in India Live in uh, uh, 2014, a lady who was very, very uh, 
the unhealthy lady, she was weighing only 36 kilos and she was not suitable for surgery for various comorbidities. Got a calcific uh, LAD, calcific left main, osteum of the circumflex, which is dominant and, uh, and a thrombotic lesion after the first uh, OM, which was again treated with combination of rotoplater and multiple sending and got a reasonable result at the end of the procedure. What do we do, do today? Have we changed our style of practice and style of intervention? Yes, we did have, we have changed significantly with the advent of imaging modalities, what is available to us. You can see a significant disease of the distal left main, then involvement of the circumflexes, as well as the LED, or proximal LED, including the diagram, which was treated with multiple devices, cutting balloon, followed by OCT. You can see OCT gives us a, all the measurement of the both proximal and distal vessel. Distal vessel is 5.43 and proximal vessel is 9.65 millimeters square. Post cutting balloon, you can see all the disruption of the plaque and the intima is disrupted, which was treated with a long stand into the LAD, followed by a treatment of the diagonal by a tap technique. This was uh, followed by treatment of the circumflex uh, osteum into the distal circumflex also. The, once we complete the procedure, we did an OCT to confirm what we have done is perfect and we have to confirm that everything has been done correctly. You can see now the left main diameter is 11.74 and proximal LED is 9.76. Very, very acceptable result. And final result was the angiographically like this. This patient came back for with the angina after at the end of one year. What we found was left main circumflex was LED was absolutely fine, had a small resnosis at the ostium of the diagram, which was eminently treated. And we did interrogate this patient with the OCT and OCT shows very, very interesting features that the whole stem into the LED and diagonal, everything was totally endothelialized and with no stem start seen in the lumen with uh, maintaining the whole texture of the intima very well and no recurrence or resonance. All this is very encouraging result. Now, what did we learn by looking at all this? angiograms, all this data, what we have. But let us combine all this data, what is available uh, of all these, all those four studies of five-year follow-up data. What did we understand from the, these studies? We understand that what bothers us, the Achilles seal heel is the re repeat revascularization, which is significantly high in PC PCI when you compare that of surgery. So as long as we realize that we have a limitation of repeat revascularization in uh, PCI. We, under, we, we know what we should do. We have now tried to combine what is all the data after the Excel and Noble. Um, 18 studies, we, we looked at the meta analysis of all 18 studies together after the Excel and Noble. What did we find out? We found out that in the current meta-analysis of low to intermediate risk patients with left main disease, PCI was associated with similar rate of mortality, MI stroke at the median of 39 months, but higher rate of unplanned reverse well. That's all the problem is, except that everything else is satisfactory. As long as we can manage that repeat revascularization issue, uh, repeat procedure, then angioplasty possible, uh, possibility is there. But all this meta-analysis doesn't give us a confirm in a given patient what we should do. With all this data, what has happened is CSA has upgraded the status of the uh, in, in, in intervention for left main coronary artery disease to a 2A class. What 
how can we improve these results? When you go into more and more uh, data available in the literature, we understand that use of imaging has changed the out outcome of left main coronary artery management. The if you combine on all your left main coronary artery disease treatment with IVUS, the it is associated with 40% reduction in all cause or death and 53%. Reduction in cardiac death, and then we looked at what is the data available. Port versus kissing balloon. We we have enough of evidence from the COBIS two registry that port is an absolute uh, uh, absolute indication, and port reduces the cumulative incidence of uh, the stent. Uh, stent occlusion and stent thrombosis. The crucial role of port is very, very well aware to all of us. Port is more important than in left main bifurcation because of the size discrepancy of the main vessel and the side band. So it is extremely important that the port, we should, we should end up the procedure with the port. Now there is enough controversy between whether it is a one stent or two stent strategy is better. We have been always told and we have enough of data available in the literature that one stent strategy is better. But if you look at this one particular study, which was presented at TCP last year, we found that two stent strategy had definitely reduced maize, cardiac death, Myocardial infarction as well as stent thrombosis would be found to be less with the two cents. One cents, the, the cardiac death through three years also was favoring a two cent strategy. But to the conclusion, two cent strategy yielded lower incidence of cardiac death at the end of uh, three years in left main bifurcation. Which, which, uh, what technique would be used for the left main bifurcation? There are so many. Uh, technique what is available, crush, two-lot, kissing, or uh, DK crush, so many techniques. To me, it, uh, it is very, very definite. All techniques are good, but what works well in your hand is the best technique. I don't go by just what what is available in the literature by one particular technique is the best for bifurcation. In conclusion, what, do we, what have we learned? I would put it very clearly. I would strongly advise imaging in all cases. I was preferable in iota osteo lesion, but OCT would be preferable in left main bifurcation and proximal and distal lesion. Still, as of today, evidences are more in favor of CAB. And implication for next guideline, my personal view is when you look at all this data and want to have a definite guideline what we should do. We have to evaluate these data more critically. Recommendation, I feel the recommendation could become class one indication for PCI and an acceptable or even preferred choice in selected left main coronary artery disease. With more randomized study, current B level of evidence for left main revascularization by PCI or CABG should be upgraded to 1A in low and intermediate risk categories. In general, I expect new left main, recommend, left main recommendations to be more patient centric based on early and long term trade off of each procedure. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matthew Samuel, for this uh, presentation on left main. And as mentioned before by my co-chair, Dr. Yagopal, in the interest of time, we will go on with the next uh, presentation, and then we will have hopefully uh, time for discussion at the end. And it's my pleasure uh, to invite to the virtual podium Alaide Echiefo. Alaide, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Very good. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, no. Let me see if it works because it gives some uh, okay problem as always. So in the meantime, okay. I introduce you, Alaide. Mm -hmm. So Alaide yes. is from Milan, Italy. Is very experienced interventional uh, cardiologist, very prominent. Among others, she did. Uh, she's doing 
uh, consensus document on COVID uh, and how to get in, how to get out from COVID. So very, uh, very timely uh, document. So thanks for that. And um, today um, your talk will be on the role of uh, mm. particular assist devices for high risk uh, PCI. So, uh, allied. Yes, but uh, yes, Can I'm having some problem. Yeah, yeah, I'm sharing, unfortunately. It's always like that. So maybe what somebody from the technique can help. Yeah, because they have it. They have my presentation. So. Anand, can you run it from there? Yeah, no, it's, it's not opening. We give a problem with the, with the Zoom. Okay, let's see. It's not going. Yeah. Madam, you're facing a problem? Yes, I have a problem with the, with the Zoom sharing, unfortunately. So, did you open up your presentation? Yes, it's here. No, I cannot open from the Zoom. So, since uh, I sent you also the presentation, maybe you can uh, uh, share from there? I don't know. Because it's no, it's not, not come to us, ma'am. I don't understand. I know it's not appearing, so we have to sort it out. So, or you show them. It's, it's uh, what I would suggest is, hey, are you able to see the share button? Uh, yes, we, it's from not the working. We hear you not well. Uh, people in the technique, yeah. please stay away from the microphone. We cannot hear you well. Okay. No, it's not going. Okay. Okay. Is this better? Okay. Yes, it's yes but it's, okay. yes. there right. is no so, solution for that. Or you share from there because it's not opening the preference of the system, the laptop. So for whatever reason now. Okay. Let me see if it goes. Somewhere. What I suggest is uh, stop the going. sharing. Okay. No, but I never did it. Okay. I so tried. You only, have I, your, I you only have your PowerPoint on your screen? It's not working. So I don't think we have to do like that. The only way to do is I can send you the slides and you put in. Okay. So the there question is, no is do, do we have Dr. Opendra Kaul? Is he on? Dr. Opendra Kaul is there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Very much so here. Maybe, the que maybe okay. we go, if you agree, yeah. with your presentation. In the sure, meantime, yes. I, the, the technique sort out uh, the. Okay, the which is the problem. Dr. Okay. Okay. So in the meantime, could I get your mobile number in which I could call you? Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. I, I text you. Yeah. Okay. Please. okay. So, uh, um, so maybe uh, yeah, Dr. Can you see my presentation? introduce uh, your colleague. Yeah. Uh, we welcome Dr. Vendra Kaul to. Uh, he is the chairman of the Batra Heart Center, former professor and head of the department. And then uh, I'd like to uh, invite him to give a talk on coronary calcification, still an Achilles heel of PCI. Dr. Professor Dhindra Kaur, please. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to make me one of the participants of this uh, very important symposium, CSI, at European Society of Cardiology session. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest and no disclosures for this presentation. Well, we know there are many kinds of complex coronary lesions, diffuse atherosclerosis, high thrombus burden, severe tortuosity, but presence of significant or dense calcification is one of the most complex situations out of all. And we know all angioplasty people know that how it can, you know, bug your procedure. We know calcification in the coronary arteries. This is a classical example. The right coronary artery is a typical ragged appearance. And we know that they are more often seen in elderly people, more often seen in males. And that's because of some regulatory mechanisms which affect the bone formation getting involved. This can be atherosclerotic, which is usually in the intima, or it can be medial arterial calcification. Inflammatory markers are often presented. That means that calcium is not just there like a tone. It is, you know, going and coming and is inflamed. It can increase. It's an active process seen more often in elderly people, diabetics, metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, which is on an increase. What are the problems associated with calcified lesions? Well, first of all, they're likely to receive incomplete revascularization more frequently. 
Uh, if not performed properly, it leads to higher strain thrombosis, higher rate of ischemic target lesion failure in the follow-up, and they are independent of the clinical presentation and the stent type and all that. And they are also related to comorbidities like diabetes and chronic kidney disease. They have their own attrition. And basic problem is difficulty in the lesion preparation, failure to cross the lesion with the balloon, dilate the balloon, and the balloon, cross the stent. All this, uh, we know the problem. How do you identify coronary calcification? Well, when it is dense, it is first detected in the patient undergoing angiography as a, you know, you can see it as a shadow along the coronary artery, as you can see on the right side of the panel before the contrast injection. And at times when you put in the contrast, you feel some filling defects, sometimes mistaking it with the thrombus. But angiography can at best detect only one third of the calcifications and all depends on the arch of the calcium. Well, detection of accuracy by different imaging techniques is different. When it is severe, as I told you, concentric, all round, then all the methods, angiography or intravascular imaging, you find it easily. But it is the moderate and uh, milder forms of calcification, which are very frequent missed with angiography and you find during the procedure that you're not able to tackle the lesion. In this, both intravascular imaging, IVAS and OC can be done. And we also know that the thickness of the calcium, which is very important to find as was being discussed by Professor Reber, is very important to find whether the lesion is going to crack or not. In that, OCT clearly scores of over IVAS. And also the longitudinal calcium length, which again is very important in deciding how to proceed, is once again OCT is clearly superior. Calcium arc can be found by both IVAS and OCT. So this is some of the different you know, imaging techniques differently seen, but OCT in general uh, looks at more practical points for the management of the calcium in uh, these patients. Now, as you can see here, calcific lesion can be measured in the OCT, as you can see here. Such a thick, if it is more than 0 0.38 or 65, then you know this cannot be cracked. Similarly, a concentric luminal calcification, you know that it's difficult to handle just with a balloon. This concentric calcium can also be seen by the OCT equally well. Arc of calcium, once again, can be seen by both the methods. We are seeing more and more of calcified lesions, as you can see during the different eras of angioplasty. Now, more than one third of the patients have significant calcification because we're taking sicker patients. Angioplasty is widening its indication and diabetes and renal failure is a problem with the elderly people. And many elderly people come for PCI in preference to bypass surgery. What are the interventional tools? for calcific coronary lesions? Well, we have the ablation techniques, rotational atherectomy and orbital atherectomy. We have balloon-based and cutting balloon, scoring balloon, and recently introduced in the last few years, the super high pressure uh, uh, balloons. We have a new thing come, which has come in the last couple of years, lithoplasty and excimer laser, which uh, we don't very frequently use because of uh, you know infrastructure and use of the equipment and expense of the procedure and no particular specific advantage over the other debulking techniques and uh, uh, what we're going to discuss. The best known ablation method as Dr. Matthews was showing in some of the densely calcified lesions is the ablation method. Protablator which is used for calcified lesions, which are often undilatable, difficult to cross with the balloon, osteal calcified bifurcations. It produces minimum risk of side branch occlusion. We know that it goes with the differential cutting principle. That means it, uh, on the inelastic tissue, the calcified lesions, the fibrous lesions, it, uh, you know, acts, but the elastic tissue, it's just, you know, deflected away and does not produce any damage there. And the technical considerations are that we do with a 
single bar usually. Sometimes it has to be upgraded. We go with a rotational speed, which is very high, 140,000 to 150,000. And the technique is very important. Gradual burr advancement using a pecking motion. You never push it through. Short ablation times, hold on, come back, and avoid a deceleration by more than 5,000 revolutions per minute. These are some of the golden rules of uh, road ablation. And then find the uh, polishing ramp. What it does, it minuscule particles are produced when it ablates, and these small particles are taken away by the reticular end of the system. And, uh, hardly do we see slow flow phenomena, no flow phenomena. Well, this is the kind of example that rotablator atherectomy produces a reasonably very good smooth lumen as compared to a balloon lesion, and after stenting, you know, it uh, opposes it very well. Now, here is a patient with a calcified right coronary artery lesion, and one is trying to balloon it. And as you can see, that in spite of using very high pressure on a non-compliant balloon, it is just not opening up. So these are the situations where we use a rotablator with a slow pecking motion till the time it crosses it, and followed by an easy dilatation of the balloon, putting in a stent, and it becomes a very easy procedure, you don't have to use many balloons, and uh, those who are used to it know that how you know easily it can be done if you predict it in advance that is a diff difficult complex lesion. Orbital etherectomy, which came and is not at all popular, but it again has a crown, which is rotational, and there are differences between rotablator and orbital etherectomy, where in or orbital etherectomy there's an oscillation of the crown and it is more of an eccentric result rather than a more concentric result rotablator. And the debris which come out of it are un, you know, much bigger than the rotablator, great size. And the cutting mechanism is circumferential. Target lesion opening is much less. So if you look at rotation that threatened me, by rotablator shows lower rate of complication. These are not head-to-head uh, -head studies, but you can see that in the Orbit 2 study, you can see dissections happening in about 11% of patients and you know slow flow occurring in 1% perforation, whereas complication in rotablator were much, much lower. So that's what is the feeling of everybody uh, who is involved in these procedures, that uh, rotablator is much more preferable. Region. What about cutting balloon like flexdome, which has, you know, atherotome, microsurgical blades with flex, and it is good for, you know, fibrotic and calcifer lesion, but crossing a lesion with a flexdome is difficult, and uh, once it crosses, uh, you can do it, but uh, it's not a very user-friendly device, in spite of it being modified from time to time. Scoring balloon is easier, easier to cross. It has got, uh, you know, uh, nitinol circumferential wires over it, which again cuts through the lesion, and it's called the endosculpt, which again is a device, but again in really dense calcified regions, the results are very suboptimal, not as good as debulking. What about the super high pressure balloon, the opian balloon? It is a twin layer balloon which can go up to pressures up to 35 to 40 millimeters and can bail us out in certain situations. What are the indications for this? Once again, highly calcified lesions, if you can cross them, undilatable lesions, we use in combination with rotablator, CTOs, instant restenosis, and it really replaces the cutting and scoring balloon. Let me show you one case of diffuse calcified lesions. You can see a long lesion, diffuse disease, calcified LAD in a patient coming with non-STMI and all risk factors, diabetic, hypertensive, elevated creatinine. We try with a non, you know, non-compliant balloon. Here you can see the waste not really disappearing. 2.5 non you know, non-compliant balloon, you can see it's not just not expanding. This is one of the limitations of such lesions, and it has burst, as you can see, rupture going high and Then, you take a rotablator burr, 
go with a 1.5 mm bar do a, no a run of it a later polishing run take a bigger bar 7 fiber and then you can see the same non compliant balloon easily expanded taking a 3 mm non compliant balloon here not really expanding you can see that there is this waste still there in spite of a rotor blader up to 1.75 mm bar that means a dense calcification still not been able to do the job flex dome taken once again you can see the waste is still there in spite of going higher and higher taking a opian balloon now you can see going up to 40 atmospheres and finally it gives way so that is the advantage in these uh, some patients where very high pressure is required as can be seen here followed that the procedure becomes simple you can see we have put in a stent here there's a proximal lesion which is uh, physiologically significant with an ffr of 0.74 and going again with an opian which is already with us and putting in one more stent up to the ostium and you can get a reasonably good result in very complex lesion using multiple devices indicating that in some cases multiple devices are required in these densely calcified diffuse lesions and this is the final i, I was image showing a very good optimization of the stent and well expanded stent intravascular lithotripsy as i discussed in the beginning is a new technique is also called the shock wave coronary lithotripsy system it creates a short burst of sonic pressure waves localize field effect and the integrated balloon plays a unique role its opposition to the vessel wall actually facilitates efficient energy transfer and it leads to a very high pressure generation in the lesion up to 50 atmospheres and because of this localized field effect it the lesion gives way this is one of the cases one can see a very densely calcified lesion and you can see the oct showing a very dense thick calcium after the ivl treatment you can see the balloon has expanded you can see that it's really opened up and you can see the lesion is much much better seen again a patient with a trifurcation using the same procedure in all the vessel the last case you can see the basal lesion very densely calcified lesion you can see the dog bone effect rotor blader used in spite of rotor blader you can see still the result is you know balloon is not expanded this is the ivl delivery catheter at 6 atmospheres after delivery of the energy you can see post dilatation it expands and you can get a very good result so this is what is possible so there are currently two large trials going on with this new technique assessing the safety and feasibility the disrupt in coronary artery disease and it also in peripheral artery disease so the algorithm for management of calcified lesions is simple if you can cross the lesion do a rotor blader and then optimal balloon expansion and if still expansion is not coming as could see in one of the cases lithoplasty but otherwise if you are crossed you pre dilate if there is a deep calcium use rotor blader or orbital lithectomy optimally expand the balloon in those situations like i showed in one of the cases it does not expand then lithoplasty balloon so we today have several devices to handle these patient so if i have to give a take home message it is that calcified lesions are being encountered in a large number of cases larger number of cases because of an aging population chronic kidney disease increasing diabetes all over interventional cardiologists need to develop skills to deal with calcified lesion and now with the dedicated new tools and good imaging facilities treatment of calcified lesion for most cases may no longer remain the achilles heel it used to be once thank you very much
Okay, so I'm stopping so, the sharing. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much uh, for this nice presentation, Dr. Uh, Pendro Kau. And it's uh, now my pleasure to invite again uh, Alaide. Hopefully, she, uh, the whole technical issue are... Uh, yeah, yeah, are, sorry. <laughs> and uh, among other, actually, Alaide is, uh, is uh, um, the, the first author of a joint uh, consensus document from the IPCI and the Association of Cardiovascular Care on percutanous uh, um, left ventricular assist device. So nobody better than Alaide could give us uh, an insight in this uh, very uh, timely and, and important topic. Alaide, so the virtual floor is yours. Hopefully you can use it. Okay, so they are sharing the slides. So for the time being, we see the people in the technique <laughs> doing and now that. We see yeah, your that's for me. <laughs> okay, Excellent. thank you. You know, sometimes Zoom is like that for whatever reason. Nobody knows. Whatever. Okay, so first I would like to thank Marco for the invitation and the Cardiological Society of India for this invitation. Uh, in these slides, uh, it is the topic, uh, my affiliation also, all my contact, if you want then to contact me to pose me any question. So please, if you can go on the next slide. Uh, so in these slides, uh, indeed, uh, it is, uh, um, it is shows the different uh, percutaneous ventricular assist devices that are available, at least in Europe nowadays, intraortic balloon pump, uh, microaxial pump uh, as in Pella, Tandem Art and via ECMO. Uh, as you know, um, there are important differences in physiopathology and mechanism of action of these different percutaneous ventricular assist devices. The most uh, known and have been used for so many years is intraortic balloon pump, but this is limited by the cardiac flow that is capable to produce only between 0.3 and 0.5 liter minutes. In the Impella, uh, exists in different variety from Impella 2.5, Impella CPN5, and is capable indeed to give a cardiac flow of 2.5, Impella 2.5 CP up to four, and Impella 5 up to five. Uh, and then there is standard art uh, that is not so, so much used, we will see later on, and the uh, ECMO that can give you a flow of three to seven liter minutes, and this is very important. Different mechanism, I will not go so much into that. Uh, important is the different sheet size from seven, eight French of intraortic balloon pump to 13 and 14 French, uh, respectively, for Impella 2.5 and Impella CP and up to uh, 21 French of Impella 5.0, which is mostly uh, so with the surgical cut down, or uh, it has been developed also the transaxillary uh, percutaneous uh, um, access. Um, and indeed, uh, much larger the access of tunnel art via ECMO. Um, mostly they are used by femoral artery uh, access. As I said, for 5.0, there is also transaxillary uh, percutaneous access that we are reusing at least in my center. Um, important difference on the afterload because both uh, intraortic balloon pump, pump and impella are decreasing afterload in the DIA ECMO is increasing and this is one of the limitations for example of these devices in uh, uh, acute, uh, coron uh, acute coronary syndrome and cardiogenic shock as a complication of uh, MIs. If you can go to the next uh, uh, slide, please. And uh, non-emergent high-risk uh, PCI is uh, the field where there is a lot of development nowadays of percutaneous uh, uh, ventricular assist device. Uh, as we know, non-emergent high-risk PCI are um, defined as a combination of uh, patient comorbidities, uh, with uh, um, heart failure, diabetes, age, PVD or prior surgery, complex coronary artery disease uh, as uh, multivessel disease, unprotected left main, CTO and calcified lesion, and hemodynamic compromise with stable or decompensated left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35 or hemodynamic instability. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, um, a clinical expert consensus document that uh, Italian Society of Interventional Cardiology 
work together with Spanish and Portuguese International Cardiology Society addressing the role of percutaneous ventricular assist device in non-emergency high-risk PCI as we were defining in the prior slide. Uh, clearly, we are targeting a patient where there is no cabinet option and it is plan a PCI. Uh, the idea at that uh, time was uh, to look to the femoral axis, if it's suitable or not, clearly, and which is the size of the femoral axis. That is an important limitation for the percutaneous ventricular assist device that we are going to use, uh, as we have seen in the first slide. If uh, um, there is not a, a femoral axis suitable for axial flow pump, you can still evaluate intraortic balloon pump. Also because we have to take into account that in some countries and in some localities, uh, uh, this is the only device they are available. And even if, as I will talk also later on, this is not indicated, by the way, by European Society of Cardiology guidelines, we do have to take into account there are some realities where it is the only device they have available. Uh, indeed, if the femoral axis is suitable for uh, microaxial flow pump more than six millimeter of uh, size of the femoral, uh, and there is, uh, uh, you have to evaluate if there is uh, uh, hemodynamic uh, compromise. Uh, if it's not, uh, you can still use 2.5 uh, or if it is uh, indeed in Pella CP. I have to say that the tendency nowadays is to use in Pella CP more than 2.5 because there is only one French of difference in size and indeed there is an important impact in the flow that the device is going to provide you. Next slide, please. And this is indeed taken from uh, what uh, Marco was mentioning, the joint EAPCI ACBC expert consensus document on PVAD. It is still submitted. It was a really long work that we have been doing. And among the different topics touched in this consensus document, there is high-risk PCI. As you can see in uh, this uh, document, uh, intraortic balloon pump is not indicated uh, and the evidence comes from uh, the BCIS1 uh, study that did not provide any benefit of the usage of intraortic balloon pump versus nothing in high risk PCI. For axial flow pump, indeed, the evidence comes from PROTECT2, even if uh, there are important limitations that are, we'll discuss uh, in the next slides. But this can be considered in highly selected patients undergoing high risk PCI in case of acceptable femoral access. And this concept again comes into attention. More than six millimeter diameter of common femoral artery and non severe tortuosity. Indeed, via ECMO, according to our expert consensus document, not, should not be used because there are no data available supporting the indication of ECMO in high risk PCI. Uh, next slide, please. As I said, uh, the only randomized clinical trial that we have available for high-risk PCI is the PROTECT2. Uh, PROTECT2 is a study from the past, as you can see the uh, publication is uh, from circulation uh, uh, to, uh, 2012, so lots of time ago. And the patients that enter into the trial were patients requiring prophylactic hemodynamic support during non-emerging high-risk PCI as defined of PCI on unprotected left main or last patent conduit and LVF less than 35 or true vessel disease and LVF less than 30. Patients were randomized in intraortic balloon pump plus PCI versus Impella 2.5 plus PCI. Primary endpoint was 30-day compost of major adverse event as defined in, in the slides. And uh, indeed, the secondary endpoint were 90. Uh, day composite uh, major adverse event. Uh, next slide, please. Unfortunately, the trial that had as a primary endpoint the 30 day uh, major adverse event did not uh, reach uh, the primary endpoint because there was no difference. There was only a statistical trend, but no statistical difference uh, in the occurrence of the major adverse event, uh, event of Impella versus intraortic balloon pump. Indeed, at 90 days, uh, there was uh, a significant reduction in the composite endpoint in favor of uh, Impella. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, recently, it has been uh, uh, indeed the, um, conducted a registry, Protect Tree, from the company producing uh, Impella. And uh, as you can see from the slide, uh, when they were evaluated, the patient in Protect Tree with uh, similar uh, characteristics as the patient that were indeed included in Protect Two that we have been described before. Uh, when we compared intraortin balloon pump in Protect Two in in Pella 2.5 in Protect 2 and indeed the, the use of in Pella 2.5 and CP in Protect 3, as you can see, there was a significant reduction in anti-day maze uh, um, with uh, uh, the Impella 2.5 and CP that were used to Protect 3. And this would have been uh, significant uh, as compared with intra balloon pump. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the same concept, uh, but given a landmark analysis that was not taking into account uh, uh, the post-procedural MI. So when you did not take into account uh, the impact of uh, post-procedural MI into the uh, composite major adverse event, uh, and you take only the event three days after, uh, the advantage of uh, Impella as compared with the intraortin balloon pump represented uh, uh, in the red uh, uh, curve, in the green indeed, is uh, uh, the Impella usage in Protect 3 in a match comparison as Impella in Protect 2 and uh, intraortin balloon pump in uh, Protect 2. And as you can see, the impact on uh, uh, the major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular event uh, is even more significant. Next slide, please. Impit registry was indeed uh, the registry that was conducted uh, in Italy thanks to the Italian Society of Cardio Interventional Cardiologists. And we published last year in our intervention 406 patients, and half of them uh, um, were used uh, indeed in Pella for high risk PCI. Next slide, please. Baseline characteristics of high-risk PCI, clearly these are very high-risk patient. Uh, diabetes present in 46% of the population, very high uh, prevalence of diabetes uh, as compared with other studies with the Italian population. These are people with uh, chronic kidney disease in 38% of the, uh, the cases. Uh, they have also uh, right ventricular dysfunction in 13% and a mean ejection fraction of 31. Uh, next slide, please. Impla Impella was implanted before PCI in 66.7% of the patient and removed immediately after in the majority 83. Um, mostly this was uh, in indication for uh, left main disease or three vessel disease of use of rotational aterectomy. Next slide, please. And these are the in-hospital outcome, death rate very low, only 5.7%, access site bleeding 7.9%, and one year outcome, uh, the mortality for cardiac cause, 14.8%, uh, which is compatible for the risk profile of the patient and the uh, composite endpoint of death hospitalization for heart failure, LVAD, or heart transplantation occurred in 23.3% of the patient. Next slide, please. Important message from this registry, the benefit of pre-PCI usage of Impel in terms of one-year mortality as of the, um, indeed, the prevalence of the uh, composite endpoint, as you can see from this slide. Next slide, please. And indeed, the importance of complete revascularization. This is another sub-analysis from the registry that shows uh, when you do a complete revascularization that you can do with the usage of Impella, there is a reduction of the primary endpoint of all cause death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. And also, this is mostly driven by the reduction of non-fatal MI. Next slide, please. In conclusion, with the aging of the population, increasing number of patients considered high risk for surgical revascularization, indication for PCI are overexpanding and now include high risk PCI. 
Despite the lack of positive randomized trial, the concept of PVAD in iris PCI has become more widely promoted. Intraortic balloon pump has been widely used for decades to provide hemodynamic support. However, the only adequate power randomized clinical trial, as we said, did not show any benefit of the usage of intraortic balloon pump. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, next, please, next slide, please. Uh, indeed, axial flow pump is the most frequently used PVAP. Protect 2 show no benefit in the primary endpoint, but did show a benefit in the secondary endpoint of 90 days. Additional data come from national registry and single and multicenter experience that are encouraging finding, especially in case of pre-PCI use and complete revascularization. However, there is need for adequately power randomized clinical trial and large national and multinational registries to better define patients who may benefit from PVAD and how best to evaluate, monitor, and manage every aspect of patient care. And by the way, PROTECT4 trial will randomize Iris PCI to Impella versus no Impella and will be starting soon. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shifo, for an excellent presentation. So we have had really four excellent lectures and I think you know, the Topic is open for discussion. Uh, so maybe, hey, Dr. Yagopal, please let me know how many, what is the time we have a uh, disposal for, uh, for uh, we, discussion? We can, we can go for maybe about 10 minutes, 8 to 10 minutes. Excellent, excellent. Very good. So maybe I start with the, the, the first uh, question, then I leave it the next to you. Maybe uh, in the... Uh, in the order of the presentation, all were excellent, and I would like to thank all the speakers for that. Maybe the first one to uh, Lawrence, if Lawrence is still with us. Uh, yes, Lawrence is there. So, obviously, we have two uh, uh, intravascular um, devices for imaging, IVUS and OCT. And now uh, we are talking to our Indian friends. Obviously, uh, cost is also an issue to take, be taken into account because the patient frequently has to pay by his own pocket. Number one. And number two, uh, there is also a concern with the dye, contrast media uh, with um, OCT. So in the, let's say in an Indian perspective, also with some kind of limitation in the financial issues uh, are, are relevant. So when would you use, uh, for which patient would we use uh, really uh, intravascular uh, imaging? And in those patients, which one would be uh, the best for you? Sure, uh, answer. Yeah, thank you, Marco. So basically, I would say that a good indication is present uh, with a conservative approach in about uh, five percent uh, of uh, patients, which is not too much and uh, clearly affordable. And if we were to choose, I think it's uh, vastly uh, operator preference. I see clear benefits of OCT over IVUS in patients wherever you have to detect thrombus. I think this is something uh, that you cannot uh, uh, do with uh, IVUS with enough precision. So uh, in setting of uh, ACS, clearly OCT has some uh, key advantages as well as in the detection of calcium. I think these are the two key benefits. And everything else you can do basically with both uh, modalities. And uh, I think uh, what also counts is, uh, of course, operators' uh, experience, because you should not use a technique with which you are not familiar. So I can a short uh, answer. So in your experience, we are, you are obviously very experienced. What is the amount of dye that you use for uh, um, OCT study? Yes. So basically here I would say that you probably safe dye. Why? Because you have to learn to integrate it uh, efficiently, the OCT, which means that you never do an OCT without angio and you never do an angio per se. So basically in a streamlined procedure, you do your diagnostic angio, then an OCT, and from then onwards, only angio and OCT together. You would never do an angio on its own. And with that, you don't need more contrast. Per OCT pullback, you need 10 cc, which is maybe 2, 3 cc more than you would just use for, uh, an for, for an angio. 
So it is important to streamline the procedure if you routinely use OCT. If you don't do it, you will have a surplus of 50 to 100 uh, cc dye. That's clearly not what we, uh, what we want. So therefore, it's important really to streamline your procedure and always use it together. Professor Reber, uh, yeah, Professor uh, Reber, the uh, issue sometimes in acute coronary syndrome, no doubt, uh, OCD is very helpful in the context of an acute coronary syndrome and thrombus, more so in acute stent thrombosis. You really want to elucidate the mechanism and then you use it. But the issue sometimes is the hemodynamic instability and then you, you really wonder whether it's, it's really right to go at that point of time. And second, second question is, how free, if you were to look at for your own practice, uh, what is your preference you know, in terms of the percentage, whether you use an IBUS more or, or an OCT in your, in your daily practice? Well, personally, I'm a bit biased towards uh, OCT just because I like the method more. The, 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 the key reason why I prefer IWAS is uh, the, uh, the software that is um, providing uh, many kind of important measurements uh, without just uh, uh, without delay. With IWAS, I need to do many measurements manually, which is time consuming. And with the current versions of OCT software, uh, that is uh, really done within a few seconds. That's that's the main reason why I prefer uh, OCT, and I routinely use it in about maybe 20 percent, 20 to 30 percent of my procedures. And the added time that is required is is on average about five minutes if you really integrate it in your um, PCI flow. So therefore, not too much time, not more contrast. And uh, of course, what you mentioned in hemodynamic instable patients, I would not do OCT. Uh, you have other uh, I think priorities it's catching up. in such cases. That's very clear. You have always to be reasonable. Yeah, I think the, the technology is catching up in India as well. But I, maybe because of the uh, easy learning curve and less learning, uh, the, uh, the OCT is more popular these days in, in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, oh, I mean, over to Mark. So Makarofi, I think of Matthew's uh, presentation. Uh, so you talked about the, the role of uh, uh, imaging. I think uh, if you look, if we were to look at the studies in the earlier days, it was mostly not imaging based when, when you compared CABG with PCI in the left wing. So I think the, the advent of imaging has done a lot of change and I mean, made a difference in understanding the disease and where we are today. You think in the future, uh, in the left main, it would never be done without an imaging? Um, yeah, I would say so. I mean, there's no random, there's not a single randomized control trial that compared um, imaging guided PCI in left main versus angio guided. That clearly needs to be stated. So we actually don't have randomized evidence. However, the key trials, Noble and Excel, were performed with more than 70% of imaging. And there is one large trial, the October trial, which actually includes a large proportion of left main patients. So if you want to be very conservative, the statement would be no RCT evidence available today, but soon there will be. But I think everyone who does uh, complex procedures uh, is appreciative of the added information we can obtain by imaging. You learn a lot, and I clearly think it's to the benefit of all. So maybe... In the interest of time, so we move to the next topic, and uh, I can uh, encourage to everybody to attend one of Lawrence Reber um, workshops on intravascular imaging. They are great. I don't know if you are doing also uh, on the web, but they are definitely a, a must for all people interested in intravascular imaging. So in the interest of time, uh, the next speaker, a question for Dr. Matthew Samuel. So um, a very nice presentation on left main. Uh, in, decision making, the fact of having or not having diabetes, uh, does, it, does it matter for patients with left main disease, uh, disease in your decision making, what type of revask and um, something like that? Um, definitely diabetes, uh, patients do not do as well as non-diabetic in all interventions. It holds good with bifurcation also or left main also. Uh, I mean, as any other intervention here, diabetes definitely does better with surgery. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there was quite a um, clear message, o o although we have to say that from the guidelines, actually, the impact of uh, diabetes is more clear on three vessel disease more than on left main. But I think that globally, the, and I fully agree with you, the fact of uh, having diabetes should, let's say, globally lower the threshold uh, to go to cabbage, the, the more complex the disease, there's the uh, greatest the advantage of, uh, of, uh, of cabbage. Um, thank you for this answer. And maybe a question to Dr. Uh, um, Kaul. So uh, also, you have told us that actually uh, calcification remain uh, um, in a seal of intervention. This is a clearly no, the case. No, no, no. That's, that's uh, the best place. Stay I will stay, uh, ask stay, you, stay, stay, stay. your practice, um, I assume the rotablator is still uh, the, the main device that you're using uh, for, um, for a calcified lesion. So what about uh, uh, lithoplasty? Do you have any experience for that? Is this device uh, um, uh, commercialized in India or not? Yeah, you're right that uh, rotablator is one of the uh, highly recommended and used device in our hands in India. But lithotripsy, litho, IVL has also come in. It was introduced into India early part of this year. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it took a back seat, but it's available. And uh, what we have done a couple of cases, it seems to be a very good solution in, uh, you know, that kind of heavily calcified, but very often it is an adjunct rotablator very often an adjunct rotablator because crossing a calcified lesion with this lithotripsy balloon is not easy, you know, there's a bulky balloon. Yeah, I think this is a great point. And, and I think with all those devices that theoretically could help you in calcified lesion, first of all, these devices had to reach the lesion. Yes. And uh, this yes. is <laughs> frequently uh, the problem. But uh, uh, thanks for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. So maybe I, I will switch to, to uh, Alaide. So obviously the temptation of uh, broad use, let's say if there are no uh, financial uh, constraints, the temptation of using um, uh, notably uh, Impella, a CP, uh, is big because uh, you can implant these devices, very easy to implant, and then you can work on your patient almost, uh, you know, forgetting about him because uh, he will be hemodynamically stable. Uh, so, but again, we are, uh, we are talking to our Indian friends and obviously the, the cost of this Impella is really uh, for us also quite prohibitive. So what are the, the highly selected patients for whom you really think that either you have Impella and you do the PCI or you would say, if I, for whatever reason, cannot have Impella, then I would not perform PCI because the risk would be prohibitive. Yes, uh, we are talking about high-risk PCI. And as I said, for high-risk PCI, despite the widespread adoption and the fact that in very complex scenarios, especially when you want to achieve a complete revascularization, Clearly, if you have on board Impella, it makes your life much easier. We have to acknowledge that. Uh, however, uh, the, the data are not uh, still so clear. We have only that randomized clinical trial, and we have the evidence from or sponsor registry or, as you have seen, multinational registry. And it's ongoing the trial that most probably will better uh, clarify which are the patients that should be selected for these devices because I'm a user of Impella and uh, I, I'm lucky enough in my center to have all these uh, devices available but there is an economical constraint and there is a device related complication that we have also to take into consideration. So for high-risk PCI, honestly, according to the data we have available so far, the indication for is for Impella, because in Trotting Balloon Pump there is actually no evidence. There is, it's better than nothing. However, uh, I would uh, select in really complex patients with low ejection fraction where you have to do rotablator 
or we want to achieve a complete revascularization, awaiting for the data from the randomized clinical trial. Another story indeed is cardiogenic shock, for example, or very high risk mice where the indication, even if again, we don't have a clear randomized clinical trial is really saving a life. So if you have available, you have to use it in according to the evidence you have so far in a very high complex scenario when you want to achieve a complete revascularization. Uh, if you do not have it available, uh, there are patient, there is no evidence for intraortic balloon pump. You can accept intraortic balloon pump really when you are starting to have some hemodynamic compromise and you don't have any, anything else than, than that. Otherwise, if you have the capability yeah. to have uh, Impella, honestly, nowadays uh, there is no yes. need for interrupting balloon pump. Maybe but my last comment, and then I give the word to Dr. Uh, Yagopal. So uh, you mentioned the PROTECT4 study. So, uh, and uh, as I see, he has also, uh, let's say, conservative arm, meaning no yes. device arm. So I think this is, will be really important because we tend to be over confident uh, with uh, those devices and we should not repeat the the mistake we did uh, with intraortic balloon pump uh, that it took uh, decades to have the randomized trial showing that it doesn't help so it's very important to to have a control arm because uh, as you mentioned those devices is also uh, a complication so please in just short answer uh, how many patients are randomized what is Design and when will be uh, a result uh, can be expected? It's still uh, ongoing the, the preparation of the protocol. So we don't have the okay. protocol still available. They're just starting. Uh, and by the way, they just define the two arms because at the beginning it was not starting like that. They even wanted to compare with the surgical arm that honestly made no sense. So this is a big trial that is going to be run by CRF and Greg Stone is the PI. And uh, they are, uh, it will be worldwide, US and Europe, and they are selecting center nowadays, but the protocol is not definitive yet. Okay, so some, some more years to go. Yes. Dr. Shifo, uh, uh, sometimes the, the access is indeed a problem. So. What about the axillary axis and how frequently do you resort to that? That's number one. Secondly, in the context of acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock, you've really seen that most of these have really no role. Uh, so uh, do you think Impella has made a difference there? Yes, regarding the access, as I said, uh, also by the company, they give the advice that you have to have ephemeral access at least of six millimeter. However, we have some evidence also uh, using uh, some kind of adjunctive device, uh, for example, as Manta device that you can also have the access with uh, uh, smaller uh, femoral arteries. But this is a cost adding on the other cost because also that device is costing on top of the impella. Having said that, transaxillary, uh, it is a possibility and we do transaxillary, you can do with the surgical cut down or you can do also percutaneous. And by the way, in my center, we do the 5.0 by transaxillary access and not by surgical cut down. And if you don't have ephemeral access, that, that can be a possibility. But again, you need also a learning curve for that uh, to do the percutaneous access, but this is possible. Uh, regarding the need myocardial infarction, there are two different entities. One is myocardial infarction with, without uh, uh, cardiogenic shock. And for example, this is the possibility that is, uh, has been evaluated by uh, door to unload trial, which is indeed a trial that is ongoing now and is randomizing 30 minutes of unloading versus uh, nothing. Uh, in the setting of uh, acute uh, large myocardial infarction without cardiogenic shock because uh, the theory behind this uh, is that uh, unloading the left ventricle is going to reduce the infarct size uh, and this is an ongoing trial. And something else indeed is in cardiogenic shock with myocardial infarction and there is another trial ongoing which is the danger shock trial that is still ongoing with a lot of difficulties in randomizing because even if 
there is a very small randomized trial on cardiogenic shock with Impella. Uh, there is the, the tendency of all the operators to do, to use it, Impella if they have, and so the trial is going really very slowly. Hopefully, we will, it will be finished soon and it will demonstrate really that uh, Impella is making a difference. And Finally, this is something that we are using. Thank you. Uh, final comment from Dr. Matthew Samuel and Dr. Vedra Kohl. I think we are really, really running short of time. Dr. Matthew? And... I, mean, I, I don't think we, uh, there is any additional comment to be made because it was a nice session. Uh, I enjoyed being here. And uh, I only one word to all the upcoming cardiologists uh, when they are handling left main. Treat it very, very carefully. It is a different animal altogether. If you are very careful in selecting cases, you must understand that angioplasty has a major role in this intervention, all right, provided you do the right technique, right, uh, right patient, and uh, all devices to be used whenever it is necessary, especially imaging has made the difference. And I certainly encourage all the youngsters to use these devices with caution. Thank you. Yeah, you, we have entered an era when difficult lesions are seen more frequently because elderly people, we have so much of diabetes, one third of our PTCA patients are diabetics. So we need to have an access and an experience with the most of the device, especially the rotablator, because there are so many situations where nothing is going in, you have to abandon the procedure. So I think that's one of the very important things. Other thing I want to share with this panel is that we have started a trial in multivessel disease and diabetes. 85% triple vessel disease and 15% single vessel disease. Professor Basic Rofi idea. and others, uh, shall we conclude the session, please? Yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, okay. Okay. So okay. Uh, this was abrupt. I'm sorry for that. I'm not responsible. So okay. My pleasure to uh, uh, close this session on on uh, on the name of Dr. Yagopal, my co-chair. I think we had uh, really uh, had the four uh, great presentation and on high risk PCI, which is our daily business and also our daily concern also. So again, uh, it is a pleasure and honor for the ESC to be part of uh, CSI uh, 2020. We hope uh, to be uh, able to join uh, physically next year for uh, CSI uh, 2021. Have a nice meeting. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful thank presentation. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.